Moby Dick, chapters 105 to 108. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 105 to 108. Chapter 105. Does the whale's magnitude diminish? Will he perish? Inasmuch, then, as this leviathan comes floundering down upon us from the headwaters of the eternities, it may be fitly inquired whether, in the long course of his generations, he has not degenerated from the original bulk of his sires. But upon investigation we find that not only are the whales of the present day superior in magnitude to those whose fossil remains are found in the tertiary system, embracing a distinct geological period prior to man, but of the whales found in that tertiary system, those belonging to its latter formations exceed in size those of its earlier ones. Of all the pre-Adamite whales yet exhumed, by far the largest is the Alabama one mentioned in the last chapter, and that was less than seventy feet in length in the skeleton, whereas we have already seen that the tape measure gives seventy-two feet for the skeleton of a large-sized modern whale, and I have heard on whalemen's authority that sperm whales have been captured near a hundred feet long at the time of capture. But may it not be that while the whales of the present hour are an advance in magnitude upon those of all previous geological periods, may it not be that since Adam's time they have degenerated? Assuredly we must conclude so, if we are to credit the accounts of such gentlemen as Pliny and the ancient naturalists generally. For Pliny tells us of whales that embraced acres of living bulk, and Aldrovandus of others which measured eight hundred feet in length, rope-walks and Thames tunnels of whales, and even in the days of Banks and Solander, Cook's naturalists, we find a Danish member of the Academy of Sciences setting down certain Iceland whales, Raiden Sisker or wrinkled bellies, at one hundred and twenty yards, that is, three hundred and sixty feet and Lassipade, the French naturalist, in his elaborate history of whales, in the very beginning of his work, page 3, sets down the right whale at 100 metres, 328 feet, and this work was published so late as A.D. 1825. But will any whaleman believe these stories? No. The whale of today is as big as his ancestors in Pliny's times, and if ever I go where Pliny is, I, a whaleman, more than he was, will make bold to tell him so. Because I cannot understand how it is, that while the Egyptian mummies that were buried thousands of years before even Pliny was born do not measure so much in their coffins as a modern Kentuckian in his socks, and while the cattle and other animals sculptured on the oldest Egyptian and Nineveh tablets by the relative proportions in which they are drawn, just as plainly prove that the high-bred, stall-fed, prize cattle of Smithfield not only equal, but far exceed in magnitude the fattest of Pharaoh's fat kind. In the face of all this, I will not admit that of all animals the whale alone should have degenerated." But still another inquiry remains, one often agitated by the more recondite Nantucketers. Whether owing to the almost omniscient lookouts at the mastheads of the whale-ships, now penetrating even through Bering Straits and into the remotest secret drawers and lockers of the world, and the thousand harpoons and lances darted along all continental coasts, the moot point is whether Leviathan can long endure so wide a chase, and so remorseless a havoc, whether he must not at last be exterminated from the waters, and the last whale, like the last man, smoke his last pipe, and then himself evaporate in the final puff. Comparing the humped herds of whales with the humped herds of buffalo, which not forty years ago overspread by tens of thousands, the prairies of Illinois and Missouri, 
and shook their iron manes, and scowled with their thunder-clotted brows upon the sights of populous river capitals, where now the polite broker sells you land at a dollar an inch, in such a comparison an irresistible argument would seem furnished to show that the hunted whale cannot now escape speedy extinction. But you must look at this matter in every light. Though so short a period ago, not a good lifetime, the census of the buffalo in Illinois exceeded the census of men now in London, and though at the present day not one horn or hoof of them remains in all that region, and though the cause of this wondrous extermination was the spear of man, yet the far different nature of the whale-hunt peremptorily forbids so inglorious an end to the leviathan. Forty men in one ship hunting the sperm-whales for forty-eight months think that they have done extremely well, and thank God if at last they carry home the oil of forty fish. Whereas in the days of the old Canadian and Indian hunters and trappers of the West, when the far West, in whose sunset suns still rise, was a wilderness and a virgin, the same number of moccasined men for the same number of months, mounted on horse instead of sailing in ships, would have slain not forty, but forty thousand and more buffaloes, a fact that, if need were, could be statistically stated. Nor, considered aright, does it seem any argument in favour of the gradual extinction of the sperm-whale, for example, that in former years, the latter part of the last century, say, these leviathans in small pods were encountered much oftener than at present, and, in consequence, the voyages were not so prolonged, and were also much more remunerative, because, as has been elsewhere noticed, those whales, influenced by some views to safety, now swim the seas in immense caravans, so that to a large degree the scattered solitaries, yokes, and pods, and schools of other days are now aggregated into vast but widely separated, unfrequent armies. That is all. And equally fallacious seems the conceit, that because the so-called whalebone whales no longer haunt many grounds in former years abounding with them, Hence that species also is declining, for they are only being driven from promontory to cape, and if one coast is no longer enlivened with their jets, then be sure some other and remoter strand has been very recently startled by the unfamiliar spectacle. Furthermore, concerning these last-mentioned leviathans, they have two firm fortresses, which, in all human probability, will forever remain impregnable and as upon the invasion of their valleys the frosty Swiss have retreated to their mountains, so, hunted from the savannas and glades of the middle seas, the whalebone whales can at last resort to their polar citadels, and diving under the ultimate glassy barriers and walls there, come up among icy fields and flows, and in a charmed circle of everlasting December bid defiance to all pursuit from man." but as perhaps fifty of these whalebone whales are harpooned for one cachalot, some philosophers of the forecastle have concluded that this positive havoc has already very seriously diminished their battalions. But though for some time past a number of these whales, not less than thirteen thousand, have been annually slain on the Norwest coast by the Americans alone, yet there are considerations which render even this circumstance of little or no account as an opposing argument in this matter. Natural as it is to be somewhat incredulous concerning the populousness of the more enormous creatures of the globe, yet what shall we say to Harto, the historian of Goa, when he tells us that at one hunting the king of Siam took four thousand elephants, that in those regions elephants are as numerous as droves of cattle in the temperate climes. And there seems no reason to doubt that if these elephants, which have now been hunted for thousands of years by Semiramis, by Porus, by Hannibal, and by all the successive monarchs of the East, if they still survive there in great numbers, much more may the great whale outlast all hunting, since he has a pasture to expatiate in which is precisely twice as large as all Asia, both Americas, Europe, and Africa, New Holland, and all the isles of the sea combined. 
Moreover, we are to consider that from the presumed great longevity of whales, their probably attaining an age of a century or more, therefore at any one period of time several distinct adult generations must be contemporary. And what that is we may soon gain some idea of by imagining all the graveyards, cemeteries, and family vaults of creation, yielding up the live bodies of all the men, women, and children who were alive seventy-five years ago, and adding this countless host to the present human population of the globe. Wherefore, for all these things, we account the whale immortal in his species, however perishable in his individuality. He swam the seas before the continents broke water. He once swam over the site of the Tuileries and Windsor Castle and the Kremlin. In Noah's flood he despised Noah's ark, and if ever the world is to be again flooded, like the Netherlands, to kill off its rats, then the eternal whale will still survive, and rearing upon the topmost crest of the equatorial flood, spout his froth defiance to the skies. Chapter 106. Ahab's Leg The precipitating manner in which Captain Ahab had quitted the Samuel Enderby of London had not been unattended with some small violence to his own person. He had lighted with such energy upon the thwart of his boat that his ivory leg had received a half-splintering shock and when, after gaining his own deck and his own pivot-hole there, he so vehemently wheeled round with an urgent command to the steersman, it was, as ever, something about his not steering inflexibly enough, then the already shaken ivory received such an additional twist and wrench, that though it still remained entire and to all appearances lusty, yet Ahab did not deem it entirely trustworthy. And indeed it seemed small matter for wonder, that for all his pervading mad recklessness, Ahab did at times give careful heed to the condition of that dead bone upon which he partly stood. For it had not been very long prior to the Pequod's sailing from Nantucket that he had been found one night lying prone upon the ground and insensible, by some unknown and seemingly inexplicable, unimaginable casualty his ivory limb having been so violently displaced that it had stakewise smitten and all but pierced his groin, nor was it without extreme difficulty that the agonizing wound was entirely cured. Nor at the time had it failed to enter his monomaniac mind that all the anguish of that then present suffering was but the direct issue of a former woe and he too plainly seemed to see that as the most poisonous reptile of the marsh perpetuates his kind as inevitably as the sweetest songster of the grove, so equally, with every felicity, all miserable events do naturally beget their like. Yea, more than equally, thought Ahab, since both the ancestry and posterity of grief go further than the ancestry and posterity of joy." For, not to hint of this, that it is an inference from certain canonic teachings, that while some natural enjoyments here shall have no children born to them for the other world, but, on the contrary, shall be followed by the joy-childlessness of all hell's despair, whereas some guilty mortal miseries shall still fertilely beget to themselves an eternally progressive progeny of griefs beyond the grave, not at all to hint of this, there still seems an inequality in the deeper analysis of the thing. For, thought Ahab, while even the highest earthly felicities have a certain unsignifying pettiness lurking in them, but at bottom all heart-woes, a mystic significance, and in some men an archangelic grandeur, so do their diligent tracings out not belie the obvious deduction. To trail the genealogies of these high mortal miseries carries us at last among the sourceless primogenitors of the gods, so that in the face of all the glad haymaking suns and soft cymbling round harvest moons, we must needs give in to this, that the gods themselves are not forever glad. The ineffaceable sad birthmark in the brow of man is but the stamp of sorrow in the signers. Unwittingly here a secret has been divulged, 
which perhaps might more properly, in set way, have been disclosed before. With many other particulars concerning Ahab, always had it remained a mystery to some why it was that for a certain period, both before and after the sailing of the Pequod, he had hidden himself away with such grand llama like exclusiveness, and for that one interval sought speechless refuge, as it were, among the marble senate of the dead. Captain Peleg's brooded reason for this thing appeared by no means adequate though indeed as touching all ahab's deeper part every revelation partook more of significant darkness than of explanatory light but in the end it all came out this one matter did at least that direful mishap was at the bottom of his temporary recluseness and not only this but to that ever contracting dropping circle ashore who for any reason possessed the privilege of a less banned approach to him to that timid circle the above-hinted casualty, remaining as it did, moodily unaccounted for by Ahab, invested itself with terrors not entirely underived from the land of spirits and of whales, so that, through their zeal for him, they had all conspired, so far as in them lay, to muffle up the knowledge of this thing from others, and hence it was that not till a considerable interval had elapsed did it transpire upon the Pequod's decks. But, be all this as it may, let the unseen ambiguous synod in the air, or the vindictive princes and potentates of fire, have to do or not with earthly Ahab, yet in this present matter of his leg he took plain practical procedures. He called the carpenter. And when that functionary appeared before him, he bade him without delay set about making a new leg, and directed the mates to see him supplied with all these studs and joists of jaw ivory, sperm whale, which had thus far been accumulated on the voyage, in order that a careful selection of the stoutest, clearest grain stuff might be secured. This done, the carpenter received orders to have the leg completed that night, and to provide all the fittings for it, independent of those pertaining to the distrusted one in use. Moreover, the ship's forge was ordered to be hoisted out of its temporary idleness in the hold, and to accelerate the affair, the blacksmith was commanded to proceed at once to the forging of whatever iron contrivances might be needed. Chapter 107 The Carpenter Seat thyself sultanically among the moons of Saturn, and take high abstracted man alone, and he seems a wonder, a grandeur, and a woe. But from the same point take mankind in mass, and for the most part they seem a mob of unnecessary duplicates, both contemporary and hereditary. But most humble though he was, and far from furnishing an example of the high humane abstraction, the Pequod's carpenter was no duplicate. Hence he now comes in person on this stage. Like all sea-going ship carpenters, and more especially those belonging to whaling vessels, he was, to a certain off-handed practical extent, alike experienced in numerous trades and callings collateral to his own, the carpenter's pursuit being the ancient and outbranching trunk of all those numerous handicrafts which more or less have to do with wood as an auxiliary material. But besides the application to him of the generic remark above, this carpenter of the Pequod was singularly efficient in those thousand nameless mechanical emergencies continually recurring in a large ship, upon a three or four years' voyage in uncivilized and far-distant seas. For not to speak of his readiness in ordinary duties, repairing stove-boats, sprung spars, reforming the shape of clumsy bladed oars, inserting bull's-eyes in the deck, or new tree-nails in the side-planks, and other miscellaneous matters more directly pertaining to his special business, he was, moreover, unhesitatingly expert in all manner of conflicting aptitudes, both useful and capricious. The one grand stage where he enacted all his various parts, so manifold, was his vice-bench, a long, rude, ponderous table, furnished with several vices, of different sizes, and both of iron and of wood, 
At all times, except when whales were alongside, this bench was securely lashed athwartships against the rear of the triworks. A belaying pin is found too large to be easily inserted into its hole. The carpenter claps it into one of his ever-ready vices, and straightway files it smaller. A lost land bird of strange plumage strays on board and is made a captive. Out of clean-shaved rods of right whalebone and cross-beams of sperm-whale ivory, the carpenter makes a pagoda-looking cage for it. An oarsman sprains his wrist. The carpenter concocts a soothing lotion. Stubb longed for vermilion stars to be painted upon the blade of his every oar. Screwing each oar in his big vice of wood, the carpenter symmetrically supplies the constellation. A sailor takes a fancy to wear shark-bone earrings. The carpenter drills his ears. Another has a toothache. The carpenter out pincers, and clapping one hand upon his bench, bids him be seated there. But the poor fellow unmanageably winces under the unconcluded operation. Whirling round the handle of his wooden vice, the carpenter signs him to clap his jaw in that, if he would have him draw the tooth. Thus this carpenter was prepared at all points, and alike indifferent and without respect in all. Teeth he accounted bits of ivory, heads he deemed but top-blocks, men themselves he lightly held for capstans. But while now upon so wide a field thus variously accomplished, and with such liveliness of expertness in him too, all this would seem to argue some uncommon vivacity of intelligence but not precisely so. For nothing was this man more remarkable than for a certain impersonal stolidity, as it were. Impersonal, I say, for it so shaded off into the surrounding infinite of things, that it seemed one with the general stolidity discernible in the whole visible world, which, while pauselessly active in uncounted modes, still eternally holds its peace, and ignores you, though you dig foundations for cathedrals. Yet was this half-horrible stolidity in him, involving too, as it appeared, an all-ramifying heartlessness, yet was it oddly dashed at times with an old, crutch-like, antediluvian, wheezing humorousness, not unstreaked now and then with a certain grizzled wittiness, such as might have served to pass the time during the midnight watch on the bearded forecastle of Noah's Ark, was it that this old carpenter had been a lifelong wanderer, whose much rolling to and fro not only had gathered no moss, but, what is more, had rubbed off whatever small outward clingings might have originally pertained to him? He was a stripped abstract, an unfractioned integral, uncompromised as a newborn babe, living without premeditated reference to this world or the next, you might almost say that this strange uncompromisedness in him involved a sort of unintelligence, for in his numerous trades he did not seem to work so much by reason or by instinct, or simply because he had been tutored to it, or by any intermixture of all these, even or uneven, but merely by a kind of deaf and dumb spontaneous literal process. He was a pure manipulator." His brain, if he had ever had one, must have early oozed along into the muscles of his fingers. He was like one of those unreasoning but still highly useful, multum in parvo, Sheffield contrivances, assuming the exterior, though a little swelled, of a common pocket-knife, but containing not only blades of various sizes, but also screwdrivers, corkscrews, tweezers, awls, pens, rulers, nail-filers, countersinkers. So, if his superiors wanted to use the carpenter for a screwdriver, all they had to do was to open that part of him and the screw was fast, or if for tweezers, take him up by the legs, and there they were. Yet, as previously hinted, this omnitooled, open-and-shut carpenter was, after all, no mere machine of an automaton. If he did not have a common soul in him, he had a subtle something that somehow anomalously did its duty. What that was, whether essence of quicksilver or a few drops of hartshorn, there was no telling. But there it was, and there it had abided for now some sixty years or more. And this it was, this same unaccountable cunning life-principle in him, 
This it was that kept him a great part of the time soliloquizing, but only like an unreasoning wheel, which also hummingly soliloquizes. Or, rather, his body was a sentry-box, and this soliloquizer on guard there, and talking all the time to keep himself awake. Chapter 108 Ahab and the Carpenter The Deck First Night Watch Carpenter standing before his vice-bench, and by the light of two lanterns, busily filing the ivory joist for the leg, which joist is firmly fixed in the vice. Slabs of ivory, leather straps, pads, screws, and various tools of all sorts lying about the bench. Forward, the red flame of the forge is seen, where the blacksmith is at work. Drat the file, and drat the bone. That is hard which should be soft, and that is soft which should be hard. So we go, who file old jaws and shin-bones, Let's try another. Aye, now this works better. Sneezes. Hello, this bone dust is... Sneezes. Why, it's... Sneezes. Yes, it's... Sneezes. Bless my soul, it won't let me speak. That is what an old fellow gets now for working in dead lumber. Saw a live tree, and you don't get this dust. Amputate a live bone, and you don't get it. Sneezes. Come, come, you, old smut, there, bear a hand, and let's have that ferrule and buckle screw. I'll be ready for them presently. Lucky now, sneezes, there's no knee joint to make. That might puzzle a little, but a mere shin-bone, why, it's as easy as making hop-poles, only I should like to put a good finish on. Time, time, if I but only had the time, I could turn him out as neat a leg now as ever, sneezes, scraped to a lady in a parlor. Those buckskin legs and calves of legs I've seen in shop windows wouldn't compare at all. They soak water, they do, and of course get rheumatic, and have to be doctored, sneezes, with washes and lotions, just like live legs. There, before I saw it off now, I must call his old mogul ship and see whether the length will be all right. Too short, if anything, I guess. Ha! That's the heel. We are in luck. Here he comes. Or it's somebody else, that's certain. Ahab, advancing. During the ensuing scene, the carpenter continues, sneezing at times. Well, man-maker? Just in time, sir. Uh, if the captain pleases, I will now mark the length. Let me measure, sir. Measured for a leg. <laughs> Good. Well, it's not the first time. About it. There, keep thy finger on it. This is a cogent vice thou hast here, carpenter. Let me feel its grip once. So, so, it does pinch some. Oh, sir, it will break bones. Beware, beware. No fear. I like a good grip. I like to feel something in this slippery world that can hold, man. What's Prometheus about there? The blacksmith, I mean. What's he about? He must be forging the buckle screw, sir, now. Right. It's a partnership. He supplies the muscle part. He makes a fierce red flame there. Aye, sir. He must have the white heat for this kind of fine work. Mm. So he must. I do deem it now a most meaning thing, that this old Greek Prometheus, who made men, they say, should have been a blacksmith, and animated them with fire. For what's made in fire must properly belong to fire, and so hell's probable. How the soot flies! This must be the remainder the Greek made the Africans of. Carpenter, when he's through with that buckle— Tell him to forge a pair of steel shoulder-blades. There's a peddler aboard with a crushing pack. Sir? Hold. While Prometheus is about it, I'll order a complete man after a desirable pattern. Imprimus, fifty feet high in his socks. Then chest modeled after the Thames Tunnel. Then legs with roots to him to stay in one place. Then arms three feet through the wrist, no heart at all, brass forehead, 
and about a quarter of an acre of fine brains. And let me see. Shall I order eyes to see outwards? No, but put a skylight on top of his head to illuminate inwards. There, take the order and away. Now what's he speaking about, and who's he speaking to? I should like to know. Uh, shall I keep standing here? Aside. Tis but indifferent architecture to make a blind dome. Here's one. No, no, no. I must have a lantern. Ho, ho. That's it, eh? Here are two, sir. Uh, one will serve my turn. What art thou thrusting that thief-catcher into my face for, man? Thrusted light is worse than presented pistols. I thought, sir, that you spoke to Carpenter. Carpenter! Why, that's... But no. A very tidy, and, I may say, an extremely gentlemanlike sort of business thou art in here, Carpenter. Or wouldst thou rather work in clay? Sir, clay? Uh, clay, sir, that's mud. We, we leave clay to ditchers, sir. The fellow's impious. What art thou sneezing about? A bone is rather dusty, sir. Take the hint, then, and when thou art dead, never bury thyself under living people's noses. Sir? Oh, uh, uh, I guess so. Uh, yes, dear. Look ye, carpenter. I dare say thou callest thyself a right good workmanlike workman, eh? Well, then, will it speak thoroughly well for thy work? if, when I come to mount this leg thou makest, I shall nevertheless feel another leg in the same identical place with it. That is, Carpenter, my old lost leg, the flesh and blood one, I mean. Canst thou not drive that old Adam away? Truly, sir, I begin to understand somewhat now. Yes, I have heard something curious on that score, sir, how a dismasted man never entirely loses the feeling of his old spar, but it will be still pricking him at times. May I humbly ask if it really be so, sir? It is, man. Look, put thy live leg here in the place where mine once was. So, now, here is only one distinct leg to the eye, yet two to the soul. Where thou feelest tingling life, there, exactly there, there to a hair, do I. Is it a riddle? I should humbly call it a poser, sir. Hiss, then. How dost thou know that some entire living, thinking thing may not be invisibly and uninterpenetratingly standing precisely where thou now standest, I and standing there in thy spite? In thy most solitary hours, then, Dost thou not fear eavesdroppers? Hold! Don't speak. And if I still feel the smart of my crushed leg, though it be now so long dissolved, then why mayest not thou, carpenter, feel the fiery pains of hell forever, and without a body? Ha! Huh? Good Lord! Truly, sir, if it comes to that, I must calculate over again. I think I didn't carry a small figure, sir. Look ye, pudding head should never grant premises. How long before the leg is done? Perhaps an hour, sir. Bungle away at it, then, and bring it to me. Turns to go. Oh, life! Here I am, proud as a Greek god, and yet standing deader to this blockhead for a bone to stand on. Cursed be that mortal inter-indebtedness, which will not do away with ledgers. I would be free as air, and I'm down in the whole world's books. I am so rich I could have given bid for bid with the wealthiest Praetorians at the auction of the Roman Empire, which was the world's, and yet I owe for the flesh in the tongue I brag with. By heavens, I'll get a crucible, and into it, and dissolve myself down to one small compendious vertebra. So. Carpenter, resuming his work. Well, well, well. Stubb knows him best of all, and Stubb always says he's queer. Says nothing but that one sufficient little word. Queer. 
He's queer, says Stubb. He's queer, 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 and keeps dinning it into Mr. Starbuck all the time. Queer, sir, queer, queer, very queer. And here's his leg. Yes, now that I think of it, here's his bedfellow. He has a stick of whale's jawbone for a wife. And this is his leg. He'll stand on this. What was that now about one leg standing in three places? and all the three places standing in one hell. How was that? Oh, I don't wonder he looked so scornful at me. I'm a sort of strange-thoughted sometimes, they say. But that's only haphazard-like. Then a short little old body like me should never undertake to wade out into deep waters with tall heron-built captains. The water chucks you under the chin pretty quick, and there's a great cry for lifeboats and here's the heron's leg. Long and slim, sure enough. Now, for most folks, one pair of legs lasts a lifetime, and that must be because they use them mercifully, as a tender-hearted old lady uses her roly-poly old coach-horses. But Ahab, oh, he's a hard driver. Look, driven one leg to death, and spavined the other for life, and now wears out bone legs by the cord. Hello there, you smut! Bear a hand there with those screws, and let's finish it before the resurrection fellow comes a-calling with his horn for all legs, true or false, as brewery men go round collecting old beer barrels to fill em up again. What a leg this is! It looks like a real live leg, filed down to nothing but the core. He'll be standing on this tomorrow. He'll be taking altitudes on it. Ah, hello! I almost forgot the little oval slate, smoothed ivory, where he figures up the latitude. So, so. Chisel, file, and sandpaper now. End of chapters 105 to 108